Welcome back to Everything Financial Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. We are chatting today with Dr. A. Gary Schilling, president of A. Gary Schilling & Company. And uh, Dr. Schilling, uh, you had mentioned in the last segment that uh, certainly the rest of the world will likely continue to devalue against the dollar. So what I interpret that to mean that you are bullish on the U.S. dollar in spite of all the money printing going on at the Federal Reserve? I am. Uh, and it isn't as though we're doing everything right, uh, but you can look on us as the uh, the tallest midget, the slowest falling rock, and the best horse in the glue factory, or <laughs> my favorite is the the uh, Val Victorian in summer remedial school. <laughs> We're the best of the bad lot. Uh, the, the dollar is the ultimate safe haven in the world of a currency of any size. And uh, right now, of course, the, the Japanese are deliberately trying to reduce the value of the yen. They don't say so. You know, nobody nobody goes into uh, currency devaluations uh, and, and says they're initiating it. They're all just catching up. It's like the mafia, you know, don't get mad, get even. Uh, but but uh, the 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 other the other thing is that that uh, we we do have uh, other currencies. The the euro, for example, is weakening. Europe the European uh, uh, situation continues bad. They combine the Teutonic North with a club nut South under one currency, the euro currency, with no common fiscal policy and none probably possible. So the Europe is weakening. Sterling is weakening. The UK is in recession. Uh, the dollar is, is strong, and I think it's going to continue to be very strong. And again, not only because of, of weakening abroad, but simply when people get scared, they look on the buck as a safe haven. I'd like to follow up on your on your Europe comment, because certainly uh, we had some re- extraordinary things happen in Europe. We had a comedian that won a large share of the vote uh, in, in Italy <laughs> yeah, on an abandoned the euro platform. Uh, the Telegraph reported that almost half of all Germans think the country would be better off outside the euro. So does the euro blow apart? How, how does this whole European situation play out? Boy, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, all I can say is there's a tremendous incentive on the part of Europeans to keep it together because the the eurozone really grew out of the decision after World War II by the French and the Germans that they had to communicate in another way than they had for centuries, which was all out war. And they figured if they could intertwine their economies, then the risk of, of military problems would be gra- greatly reduced. In other words, there's a lot of incentive to do this because of the long history of wars in, in Europe. And I think they're going to try to keep it together, but of course it's becoming increasingly difficult. And uh, these are democracies in Europe. And as you point out, uh, Italy, uh, you, had a, you had a technocrat government there trying to bring some order into the Italian situation, which is always a challenge. Uh, but they they got 10 percent of the vote. The comedian got 25 percent. Uh, and and in Germany, uh, the Merkel government, Chancellor Merkel, uh, she lost a by election last year by a, a big majority, and and she's under fire. So the the voters may ultimately just say, hey, we want out here. But the leaders in Europe would would love to keep this together. And of course, there's always a question of what happens if the thing starts to fall apart. Because if one country leaves, Greece, the most logical. Then the question is, who's next? There's a run on the banks because everybody wants to get their money out before these countries leave and devalue. Uh, it would be a first-class mess. But uh, i got to say, in our portfolios, we are short the euro currency, full disclosure. But I think it's probably going to be a good bet uh, given the problems in Europe. Let's talk about uh, investment strategies for this uh what, what arguably is a, an interesting economy, to use that term. Uh, in your recent Inside newsletter, you discussed the relationship between the Fed's money printing and the performance of the stock market. I thought it was a very interesting uh, piece that you did. Could you explain to our listeners uh, your observations? Yeah, I call this the grand disconnect because the economies of the world are limping along at best. The Eurozone's in recession. UK's in recession. Japan, China's had a, a, a slow down in growth. The U.S. economy was basically flat in the fourth quarter in terms of uh, growth. And, and so you have a situation where the economies are limping along, but yet investors are saying, I couldn't care less. As long as the central banks are shoveling money out the door, that's all I care about. It's this old Wall Street expression, don't fight the Fed. Uh, so you have this headlong rush into stocks, and, and, it's the, and, and there's also the zeal for yield. People couldn't care less of the risk. They go into junk bonds, emerging market bonds. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a whole attitude that's based on, on central bank ease. Now, 
this is a very, I think, unsustainable situation, this grand disconnect between soaring stocks and, and really uh, subdued economies at best. And I think it will be closed, but it will probably take some shock. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they won't get things straightened out in Washington with this fiscal slope. It's a slope, not a cliff. Maybe it'll have a blow up in the Middle East with a spike in oil prices. Yeah, you, you, you picked your crisis, but I think that's that will probably happen. And right now, in terms of investment, it's risk on. In other words, people are taking risk. Individual investors, they were out of stocks. They were liquidating their stock mutual funds from 2008 until the end of last year. Now they're rushing back into stocks. That's often a sign of uh, late in the cycle, if not the peak. But uh, there is this risk on trade, and I think it will last until you get some shock. Then reality sets in, and then you'll go quite the opposite, risk off. So uh, if we were to just take a look at your forecast on some, uh, on some asset classes and, uh, and, and just get your feedback on that, U.S. stocks, say, over the next 12 to 24 months, are you bullish, bearish? Well, we, we, in, in our portfolios, we, we are long stocks. Uh, and we're, 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 we hope we can <laughs> we hope we can exit uh, before the shock uh, really collapses things. But we're doing it cautiously. In other words, we're not in we're not in uh, uh, high risk stocks. We're in things like uh, dividend yielding stocks, utilities, uh, health care stocks, consumer staples, things where we think there's some substance there, where it isn't just a bet on on the stock market. You know, the idea of why you're buying it because it's going up. We want to have some substance there on the downside, but I think I think that's probably going to be the case as long as this grand disconnect lasts. What's your outlook, uh, given that you're bullish on the U.S. dollar? Does that does that mean you at this point, uh, given today's low interest rate environment, you're still bullish on U.S. Treasuries? I am, I am, because because I think we're going to see a low inflation, uh, and of course a, a strong dollar tends to tends to promote that. It makes imports cheaper. It retards exports. It retards economic growth. Uh, uh, treasuries are still a safe haven. You see the Japanese, the Chinese, recycling their current account surpluses back into treasuries. Uh, and I think there's more of a risk of deflation than inflation over the next few years, and that is another reason that people want to buy treasuries. So um, I think that uh, 30-year treasury bonds, which are my favorite, the longest issue, are still going to be attractive. And you know they're now they're now yielding about uh, three and a quarter percent. If they went down to say two and a quarter percent, then a 30-year coupon bond uh, would have a total return, including the the interest, of about 20 percent, and a zero coupon 30-year would have a, a total return of about 30 percent. And I think that then now that that's obviously based on my forecast, but that would way out distance uh, anything else that I can think of. Certainly, so. U.S. Treasuries would certainly be then, if I'm uh, hearing you correctly, near near the top of your list as far as a favorable asset class to be owning. They certainly are one of them. Yeah. Can you give yeah. us some thoughts on some of your other uh, favorable yeah, we're, asset we're, classes? Uh, we're we're long Japanese stocks, and that's uh, and short the yen, and that combination is really the the this new uh, Prime Minister Abe's government, which is determined to try to get Japan out of its 20-year uh, deflationary funk. And they are pumping money out through the central bank. Uh, they are deliberately knocking down the value of the yen. Uh, they're trying to energize the economy. And, of course, the weaker yen there is very good news for Japanese exporters. The yen has been strong for really uh, uh, since 1985, and that has made life very difficult for exporters because it's made, it's made their, uh, their exports uh, more expensive in foreign currencies. They're getting the reverse effect now. So... That's another one that we've had very good luck with over the last three months. Terrific. Well, if you're just joining us, we are chatting with Dr. A. Gary Schilling. Uh, he is the president of A. Gary Schilling & Company and the uh, uh, publisher of the newsletter Insight, which is must-reading on my list every month. If you'd like more information on Dr. Schilling's Insight newsletter, you can call 1-888-346-7444. And there'll be a nice person there to uh, answer all your questions. Uh, Dr. Schilling, uh, we talked about best performers potentially. Give us some of your least favorable asset classes moving ahead. Uh, commodities are, are certainly one. Uh, the, the commodities have been really since uh, 2002 a bet on China. The assumption is that China is going to is going to buy all the commodities of the world, and indeed, recently they've been buying over 40 percent of non-ferrous metals. 
uh, annual annual output, things like copper, tin, lead, zinc. They've been stockpiling uh, soybeans, uh, corn, uh, buying a lot of crude oil to stockpile and so on. And and the feeling is that, that that's the underpinning of, of, of a commodity bubble. And I think it has been a bubble because you've had a lot of mutual funds, uh, in, a, exchange-traded funds and so on, as well as pension funds and so on, go into commodities. And, and pension funds, when they regard commodities as asset class, I say, no way, they're a speculation. I mean, we, we use them, but you got to know you're a speculator, not an investor in commodities. And they have been declining uh, since, but, but that bubble, I think, really ended uh, in early 2011. Commodity prices have been declining since then, and I think they will continue further down because China's growth is going to be a lot slower. China's an export-driven economy. Uh, the, the takers of those exports, of Europe, Europe and the U.S., are no longer growing that rapidly, taking those exports. China's converting to an internally-led economy, but that'll take probably 10 years. Meanwhile, I think the commodity bubble is over. So would you then include uh, precious metals uh, in the commodities bubble? I'm really agnostic on, on precious metals. Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand all the forces that push them around, but I would note that oftentimes they seem to cancel each other out. you got to run in gold in the 1970s because of inflation. Then it declined for 20 years. More recently it's run up probably disdain of of, uh, of currencies got up to eighteen hundred dollars an ounce and it dropped below uh, uh, sixteen hundred uh, but uh, I really don't have a feeling beyond that all right well uh, dr. Schilling very much appreciate you taking time out of your schedule today to join us here on the everything financial radio show hope you'll come back my pleasure I'd look forward to it all right everything financial radio here on the legacy radio network will return after these words stay with us <laughs> 